Schalke 04 in the previous game, something that you heard the analyst desk refer to, which is something that I know Deficio is a big fan of with the, the Ghost Blade, the Black Cleaver, all the stuff that breaks through that armor. As uh, We'll have to see whether or not Schalke decide to stick with something similar in this game or whether or not they decide to move away and go for something a little bit more unique. So far, same bands as what we've seen already, but the teams are taking their time. On rotation number two, the Swain band for Schalke, followed by Nidalee. And that's a quicker Caitlyn band. Last time it was the third rotation. Still expect the Vlad, uh, but maybe not from Schalke's side, since Rocket are actually the ones that ban it. So in game one, what we did see from Schalke was they actually decided to ban away Vlad and Elise. So that Elise is still left up on the table for Schalke to ban away if they so choose to. Um, but there's also the Kindred still up, which I feel like Rockat, perhaps they want to make sure that Gilius doesn't get his hands on that. But I do think a Gragas ban could be very beneficial for Rockat right now as well. Yeah, well, the Rise ban comes out, and so far we kind of expect that to be happening fairly regularly. So that last ban, I mean, Rocket, they could, in theory, ban the Kindred themselves because Airwax was simultaneously the worst and best player, depending on what part of the game you were looking at. Azir, he's the one that's banned away, though. So this is the first pick over to Schalke. Now, did they instantly go for that Gragas? Is the jungle that important? Well, there are a lot of things available right now. Uh, we have the Kindred, the Gragas. Uh, you could... They're not going to pick their mid this early on into the rotation with Azir being taken off the table. Victor is a mid laner that springs to mind that could rise in popularity. Fox has had some great Victor games in the past. So we'll have to see what they decide to prioritize. Just trying to think it's it the will be the Gragas. So, so they value that so, so much. I'm curious to see if they build the same kind of composition. Like, Deficio is talking about how much he liked that, how well they were able to execute it. Rocket may not have an answer. Well, they're going to have to find one. In terms of the early game pressure, Elwax definitely outmatched Gilius, using that Kindred to its full effects. Really playing the map very well during the early parts and basically setting his team up for success a little bit better than Gilius. But when it came to these mid and late game fights, Schalke were the ones coming out ahead, just straight up executing their composition overall better than Rockat were able to. Mm -hmm. Brom being considered yet again for Rockat. He just had so much they could get done and deny, but it didn't end up being enough at the end of the game. The Victor comes in as a pick for Betsy now, and they lock the Jin on their side. So the big question for me is, what mid do we now see coming out from Fox? Uh, he could go for a Lissandra. If he wants to be hyper-aggressive, he could go for something like a LeBlanc. Uh, maybe even a Zed if he wants. Zed's a little bit more risky, but uh, Assassins typically tend to be one of those risky picks. But also Rockat actually picking themselves up the Jin. So Schalke already being denied the ability to go back to a composition that they're running in Game 1. And to be fair to Steelback, he has had some pretty impressive games on that Jin before. Two games, one win, one loss. Um, but still a very impressive KDA overall on that Jin, even in his loss, 8.7 on the Jin. So yeah. definitely knows how to make that one work. Well, Steelback has been using these longer range AD carries. The Jin has been kind of what he's fallen back to when the Caitlyn wasn't available. Teams, uh, even though it's a top tier AD carry, it's kind of still a respect ban against him. Schalke, they're going to lock the Ezreal Bard, so they've got their bot lane all locked in him. Curious to see how they can make use of the Bard because that is another champion that can really make or break a game in team fights. Certainly can. I'm surprised they managed to make it through the draft in the previous game, but it does look like Spiral are going to be returning to that Bard once more. And Bard, fantastic for setting up engages, very oppressive during the laning phase, uh, pretty much ticks all the boxes that you would possibly want in a support, and has been rising in popularity throughout the world. So, definitely a strong support pick for Schalke to be picking up. Rocket on their side, they do lock that Braum. They get Airwax back onto a very, very comfortable Kindred choice. So there's a lot of power, a lot of range as well. Uh, despite the Kindred, they, they have the Jin and Victor. I mean, this is this is lasers and shots left and right, and they can deny even more poke with the Braum. So there's good protection there as well. It's it's quite interesting that the uh, when you kind of look at the the matchups from the compositions that we have so far, the Victor and the Jin towards the late game have to be very mindful of this bard because he's going to get to a point where you can't dodge all of the bard ultimates and it's going to be really difficult for Rockat if they don't keep forcing these plays like we saw before because if it gets to this late game point they're eventually going to get caught out we might see a similar thing to what we saw from h2k versus g2 yesterday where one bard ult pretty much decided the game yeah and we saw what happened when betsy was 
you know, disrespecting with his summoner choice on Victor already. This time you could see he switched it over <laughs> right as soon as they locked again. The Varus is the mid choice now for Fox, and they round out their composition with the Trundle. That is quickly answered by an echo for Parang. So, just looking at the two compositions, Schalke pretty much going for exactly what they had in game one. Yeah. The ever so slight difference being Steve up in the top lane on this Trundle, going more towards that 1 4 as opposed to the. Uh, the heavy sort of engage that you get from the Gnar, but still really good at disengage. The pillar, very obnoxious to get around. Right. If you have to run away from your opponents, really good at that. It's also actually really good follow-up with the Bard ultimate because the moment they come out of it, they're going to have to run around and it makes it very easy to set that one up. So again, a lot of pick potential available from Schalke and Rockat. They've drafted a little bit more poke, a little bit. Uh, they still have strong team fighting with the Victor and with the Jin, and Braum is still going to be that very solid frontline disengage. I'm a little bit curious about this Echo pick. We have seen it come out from Rocket in the past. Not as strong ever since the nerfs on 611, mm -hmm. but we'll have to see how well Rocket can make it work for themselves. Yeah, that's always the big question when you talk about these skill-based matchups and the hybrid compositions. You know, they can do a little bit of both things in this game, see if they end up going once more very aggressive Schalke. They had answers. They have one win on the board, and maybe they can pick up another one. But we want to hear what you guys think at home, of course. Keep on tweeting. Keep on hitting us up. At LOL Esports is the place. Hashtag S04 win if you think the 2-0 is going to be what Schalke are going to put away against their opponents. Or if Rocket are going to tie the series up at 1-1, one one. keep that rivalry strong. Hashtag ROC win. It's going to get bloody. That is one thing for certain. And once again, the early game will likely be our priority. We want to see how both these teams look to try and set up plays during the early game. Once again, we've already discussed how Schalke do have a composition that will take a little bit of scaling. Won't quite have the same sort of double penetration, but you will actually, you are likely to see the Trinity Force being picked up by the Ezreal. So since the changes to that, he is going to be quite a powerful pick and... I'm excited to see how Schalke can make this composition work, but it's likely going to be very similar to what we saw in game one. Rocket, four members strong. We did see the scouting for the swap last time around. Fairly standard stuff. They send four members in, spotted on the ward, and Schalke scatter away. So Rocket clearly looking to see if they can spot the lane swap themselves and not maybe necessarily deal or at least just get themselves a little further ahead early on. It's Rocket, excuse me, I'm talking about. So... Schalke getting themselves some deep wards once again both teams setting up for the possibility of a lane swap if we are going to see a lane swap uh, it's actually quite a tough one to call as to who we're going to see try and avoid the 2v2 or the 1v1 perhaps both teams basically just want to go for non-standard lanes and just basically look for that very passive early game yeah still might fall back into those patterns a lot of pings flying right now rocket Attempting not to show their hand, but they are spotted as they run through the jungle. Schalke know this is happening. Are they content to take the 2v2? Or it looks like they're actually just moving back down towards the bottom side. We could be in for yet another fast push. Yeah, it does seem that way. So we're going to be seeing the standard, non-standard things. Oh, we saw some weird stuff despite the standard, right? There was all the way the push to the inhibitor turrets to start yes, things off last yes, time there around. Was. Um, but that was, to be fair to Rocket, just a really good adaptation and just playing the map very well. Oh, yeah. Taking a look at the Keystone Masteries, we got a lot of death fire on the board. And of course, that's fairly standard when you talk about the Jin, when you talk about the Varus, you want to add a little bit of burn to your long range shots. So, it looks like we will settle in before those fast pushes. Shalka on the bottom side, Rocket on the top. As soon as they clear their jungle, they actually make a move quicker. Shalka sending three members very fast as Gilius was left to do the red buff alone. Yep. And. You're just going to basically keep your duo partner of the jungle in the top in the top half of the map, which is your strong side because you have your, your bottom lane there. So nothing too surprising being seen from the early game. Shaka will get a bit of a tempo advantage because they have hit this turret first, but overall it's not going to result in any massive net gain. The big thing to note is how Rales isn't going to have as much clear as the three-man squad of... Rock at because typically when you're going for this lane swap, you want to be using your abilities to clear the waves. Whereas as you can see from Rallis, he's being forced to use his basic attacks, which means that you're going to be taking that turret a little bit slower, which will result in uh, an ever so slight tempo. Slight shift. First dragon on the board. Speaking of a uh, slowdown game, it's going to be Cloud. I have a very fun time seeing how long he lasts. Always break out your stopwatches for that one. So Steve will finally be able to grab this tower after bouncing around the wave. Rocket just about behind. Even on the heels, 
They actually have Airwax going a little bit further down into the jungle at the same time, but obviously staying on the strong side. Both teams attempting to do that. We saw him stepping a little bit out of bounds in game number one. We can only hope he's learned his lesson. So it does actually look like uh, because Schalke got to that turret first in the bottom lane, that's actually going to give them a big swing in tempo. And I wonder right now whether or not Rockat might look to try and revert to standard lanes, simply because of how much sooner Rales and Sprawl are going to get back to lane. Looks like right now that uh, they are going to continue on with the lane swap, but just think of the huge amount of experience and farm that Steve is going to get off the back of this. This could result in a big problem for Prang moving forward. Yeah, Rales wasn't even able to or was able to get there and, and grab a little bit more for himself as well since they decided to send that 2v2 up to the top side to keep it that way, forcing Parang to back off. Still not wanting to take this 2v2. Braum and Jin steal back Raze. Going to be pushing down the bottom side into Steve and you know, still settle fairly into the standard. Sprawl actually doesn't stop the Parang back. Guess he didn't see it. A little bit unfortunate for Sprawl. Not going to be able to interrupt Parang's back. But the continuation of the lane swap. I don't want to hop on about it. Yeah. Well, it's a quieter game already. I mean, at this yeah. point, last game, we were already talking about inhibitors and crazy things. and A little bit optimistic, both the team. Right? I mean, you know, we <laughs> were talking about it. It didn't say it happened yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, uh, it happened. Seeing as we do have the lane swap, weather was pretty bad in Germany this morning. <laughs> Is that what we've resorted to? All yeah. right, guys. Uh, well, clap break out your lawn chairs. We've got something to watch for a couple <laughs> of hours. Now, uh, Airwax is going to go down and help accelerate this one, obviously. Gilius has actually opted to hang a little bit closer to the mid. He could be coming up towards topside, but it's much slower. So Rocket have actually swung this a bit more in their favor. I was curious about this mid matchup, though, because last time they tried to influence it pretty heavily with the Varus, Azir, and Varus seemed to have the upper hand, especially with the help from Karma kind of coming in early on. But now it's been a very quiet affair in this mid lane, and I'm wondering which jungle is going to make the first move to try and tilt that scale. Yeah, the, the big problem for Gideon's in particular is it's a little bit harder to gank the victor. From my personal perspective, obviously, different people would argue different things, but uh, he because of his gravity field, it's a big area of zone, or as I say that. Yep, yeah, he's going to do it, but that is instantly cleansed and flashed away. He still might go down, though. Piercing arrow, first blood, and that is picked up by the mid laner of Shalka. So they get themselves a small advantage and pad the gold pockets. So just as I wanted to talk about how the matchup typically goes a little bit better for the the <laughs> for the for victor, Betsy decides to end up overextending and getting caught out. So you can see Betsy trying to be aggressive by trading back and forth. Doesn't have any vision in the bottom half of the river and ends up getting collapsed upon. It's just a big misplay coming out from Betsy. This is something that we saw from him against OG yesterday where he was just playing a little bit too aggressively and Gideon saw the opportunity, took it, first blood to shot. Honestly, really quick reaction time from Gilius. Once he saw that opening to go for it, flash body slam instantaneous. And even though Betsy burned both the summoners, yeah, there really wasn't much he could do at that point. Fox making himself look juicy, so the team working in tandem to get those baits out. And six minutes, that's our first blood. So, Schalke moving a couple members here into this bottom side, trying to establish a strong front. Might actually go for a long flank. Sprottle, if he can knock the stun, it could be even worse for Betsy. He's got no summoners here, and he's stepped far forward. Yeah, but he can run upwards this time uh, to the safety of his jungler, but is it going to be enough? Chains are on, but in comes Airwax tagging in the Chaos Storm, keeping Fox real low, but he did get the summoner heal out, and now Gilius and Sprottle realize they don't want to take this protracted 3v3. This is going to give some time, however, for Airwax and Raze, or excuse me, Steelback and Raze to try and push on this bottom side uncontested. Well, Rallis is trying to do the same in the bottom. But have a look at the positioning right now of Rockat and Shalka. You have Steve in the bottom half of the map, pushing in with a wave that's just going to knock into the tower, and Prang is going to soak all this up. Whereas Rockat, they're going to shove this wave and deny all this farm from Steve. So right now, Rockat, they're going to be able to soak up a lot more farm than Shalka is. And as long as Prang doesn't give away his life here, this should go in favor of Rockat. Yeah, Prang still able to phase dive, and he dodges from Gilius. Had to flash away from that one, but he does stay alive. Towers are going to be traded inners. This is starting to look a bit more like the last game we saw, but Rocket are the ones that are pushing a little bit faster, a little bit better, and denying that farm from Steve, who's still actually trying to tango with Parang. Well, he knows that Airwax is in the top half of the map. He knows that the likelihood of him getting ganked is very unlikely. And with Schalke right now in a good position to take away this dragon, they're going to be able to pick that one up for free. So. Not as bad as it was before, but still, you have a lot of farm being picked up by Parang. 
where Steve is going to be denied it. And there were so many good opportunities right there for Schalke to really put Steve really far ahead because of how much of a tempo advantage they had in the lane swap. They didn't take advantage of it, and that's resulted in now Parang closing the gap that was created between both the top lanes. Schalke, they opt for the moment to get themselves the Consolation Dragon. And that one's cleared off the board. Next Dragon's Ocean, a little more useful. We've seen quite a lot of both already in this series. Yeah. yeah. So, not too bad there. But you can see how quick and, and how little hesitation uh, the key ultimates are really thrown out because everyone's starting to get them. Everyone's pinging up to six. Rocket, a little bit ahead on the curve. A lot of action attempted in the mid, of course, but really it's all been about manipulating these side waves and getting the fast clears off, giving the openings. Rocket, they just seem to be doing a little bit better, although the gold is pretty much dead even. So the, the thing that I actually like from Rocket is they're, they're sticking to my mantra, which is the strong will push and the weak will receive. And often in lane swaps, your top laner gets denied a lot of farm. And to pick up those resources, what you typically want is your duo pair will always shove the wave up. That's just kind of how it happens because it's safe for them. They can afford to push past the river. And because the jungler typically hands around your strong side of the map, it's usually the safer thing to do. So as that wave is getting pushed in, you want your top laner to then be there to receive it. And so far, Rocket have done a great job of making sure that Parang is always on the receiving end of these big chunks of farm, whereas Steve is the one overextending. And fortunately, he knows that Alex is in the bottom half of the map, so he can afford to be a little bit more aggressive. But Gilius, he might be a little bit too aggressive. Yeah, speaking of, takes one, two, three. Curtain calls, finally dodging out the fourth. But there's a teleport coming in right now, and in it comes Steve being aggressive himself. Throws down the traffic cone. Airwax chunked out even further through the Lamtra Spite. He gets the heal off, but they take down Raze. They look for more. No, they turn their attention as Betsy has come right back. Very bloody affair, but it only results in one death. So many good plays there from Shaw. Oh, I spoke too soon. That's Rallis. Nice cleanup. Rallis gets himself another kill. Airwax was not expecting that whatsoever. Didn't have his flash available in Schalke. They get themselves two kills overall, which was just really smart from them overall. Simply, if you just looked at the map once again, Parang, he had to deal with a big minion wave that was pushing in the top. So yes, he could have teleported down, but he would have been down in levels. He would have lost a huge amount of farm. And it would have just been even worse for Rockat if he decided to TP down. So Steve knew that Schalke would have the numbers advantage. Rockat were not in a position where they could escape from that gank. And Schalke end up coming out ahead overall. So once more, Rockat struggling in the early game. Yeah, and Schalke, you know, utilizing the tools they have in their kit to be able to make those plays. Steve, you know, they have the, dis the disadvantage when it comes to teleports at the moment, but look at the map. There's nothing to take. There's no dragon on the board for a few more minutes. No one's really trying to contest the Rift Herald. And because all the towers have been cleared so quickly, this doesn't really punish them in any way. So kudos to Schalke, getting themselves at 1,000 plus gold advantage right now, just trying to uh, shove in Rocket. And, you know, Rocket's still having a rough time in the early game, despite the last game being an outlier. Certainly is the case. So moving forward for Schalke, this is great. Their composition. It's a big spike in the mid to late game. Varus, he wants to complete that Black Cleaver Ghost Blade. Um, actually, in fact, we saw before, more towards that heavy penetration with the uh, Mortal Reminder. There's Spraddle. Oh, he's caught. One magical journey later, though. And he's going to be wiping some sweat off his brow. Ooh, very close to Spraddle. But fortunately, by playing Bard, it does mean that you are a bit of a slippery sausage. So he's quickly able to get out of that one. Slippery it's, sausage? Yeah. It's a, I've not heard that one before. It's is British. Is that what they say in it's Wales? Like, okay. That's the Badger. Uh, that's, that's a slippery sausage. Like, you're looking sheepy. Uh, yeah, we got a bunch of phrases. All right, um, this is like another level of English, to be honest. <laughs> and Airwax, he's on another level of oh, pain. Oh, wow. That was a big collapse right there. Rales getting himself another kill. That'll enable his power spike to push even farther forward. 12 minutes in, Schalke, they're not letting up. As soon as Airwax steps out of line, he's down. Chains, insta-cleanse. And that'll stop the aggression there from Fox, but he does trade a summoner, or he trades an ultimate for the summoner. So Airwax wants to get a bit of deep vision down. Because he's on the strong side of his map, he feels that he's a little bit safer. Feels like Raze can come up and provide that support if he needs it. Nope. But he was not expecting that immediate collapse coming out from Schalke. Gideas coming in from the flank. The binding from Spraddle just made for a very easy kill. And because of all this attention that Airwax is spending in the strong side of the map, 
it's resulting in Parang constantly being forced underneath his turret. Steve is so free to overextend and be as aggressive as he wants, and if he picks up this Rift Herald, it can just be even more aggressive. Yeah, it's going to be rough for Parang for a little while now. Once this one gets started, Airwax is actually right behind it. I mean, th there's no reason for them to try and contest this, but at the same time, it's going to be so rough for Parang. Rift Herald's already down to about 3,000. The rest of Rocket are moving towards this bottom side. It's going to be Dragon in 50 seconds. And if they play their cards right, they might just be able to get here to contest it on the side of Shalka. They could very well do. The teleport is just about to come back up for Steve. Um, Rocket trying to get some deep vision down and steal away this red buff if they can. They know that the Gragas is not in the bottom half of the map because the Rift Herald has just been taken. So Rocket want to be able to pick up whatever advantages that they can. And right now, things are in a bit of a lull. The Dragon, as you rightly said, spawning in just a couple seconds. Because it's the ocean, unlikely that both teams are going to try and force this play. So, we'll have to keep an eye out. It's likely going to go to whichever team can pretty much pick it up the easier. You don't want to invest too many resources into this Ocean Drake, simply because it doesn't offer a huge amount of value this with time. But the vision is definitely something Rocket have valued around that side. Look at how many wards they've invested. A couple of pinks. They still have several in their inventories. Versus what Shalka's really brought, not a whole lot. Uh, but Shalka, they haven't really needed it as much in the moment because they just keep getting these picks. It doesn't matter if you have vision if you step outside of the range. Certainly true. Shalka do have some fantastic picks, something that they made work very nicely in game one, and they're trying to repeat in game two. Why break something? Why fix something if it ain't broke? Yeah, I know that phrase, by yeah. the way. <laughs> That's one we use on the, across the pond for sure. So Rift Her or Rift Herald, excuse me, that was already taken. The Skeletal Crab picked up by Airwax, and he doesn't die for it this time, even though a lot of the team have backed away. Rollis and Sproddle still contesting. It's the 2v2. The teams have kind of gone back to laning. You know, we talk about how it's kind of a lull pattern, but sure, they're just waiting for something that they want to contest on the map. And, you know, both teams do have a decent bit of scaling on their side, so they both will be pretty happy by not having too much aggression, especially Rocket, who are still licking their wounds. That's certainly true. And it looks like we're not going to be seeing much more aggression as we hit the 15-minute mark. Both teams just waiting to complete their first major items. Looks like Betsy going very early on for a Zonya's Hourglass, which makes sense when you have uh, double AD, triple AD coming out from Shalka. But it comes back to what you, uh, or what, sorry, what DeFisher was saying on the desk where when you have so much penetration, it doesn't matter if you're full AD. You're, you're kind of compensating for the fact that um, you do lack that AP damage by just shredding through all the armor that Rockhead is trying to build. Yeah. And Steve is definitely in a good position to punish. He's just stepping forward. I can take this red buff and I can take a bite out of Prang right while I'm at it. The rest of Rocket, however, have started this Ocean Drake real quick. They may get punished for it, though. It's taken away, smited, but the rest of Shaka are here. They find a Tempered Fate onto Airwax. In comes Gilius, does throw the barrel, but it only knocks everyone back, and he's stunned up in the gravity field, and Steelback cleans him up along with the rest of the team. Curtain call now. Not enough to finish anyone else off, but a Dragon and a Gragas for dessert. They'll be happy with that. Ooh, the snipe. Ooh, oh, raise. That's the wrong way to put your shield, but he lives anyways. Yes, he does. And Shalka, they tried to force the fight with the Bard ultimate. This was something that you and I were discussing in Champion Select, which is when you have two low mobility carriers, it is quite easy to catch those targets out, especially if they don't have flashes. But Rockat, they didn't even need to use it. So Rockat, they kick off this dragon. They don't necessarily have full vision control, but they have enough to cleanly take that one away. Sproddle only lands the ultimate onto Airwax, but because of the ultimate from Raze, he forces, he actually prevents the disengage. And that pillar from Steve, I feel actually did more harm than good, because it made it so hard for the rest of Shalka to actually follow up on the initiation from Gideas, who didn't really get an ideal barrel, and because he was somewhat left up a creek without a paddle, it was easy for Rockat to clean up that fight. Yeah, and... Shalka could have certainly lost a lot more. They did manage to get a bit of poke parting shots on the disengage, but just not enough to clean up any kills. So Rocket, they get a little bit back for themselves. They have to be feeling pretty happy with that play. Shalka, though, not letting up an inch, continuing to push down on this bottom side, but they might be stepping into a hornet's nest if they don't watch their backs. Oh, Shalka playing very aggressively on the bottom half of the map. It is a 3v3. Neither teleport available on the top laners, but... Steve, he's definitely building a bit of an advantage in this top half of the map right now. Completed the Ravenous Hydra already, working towards what I expect to be a Spirit's Visage to get a bit of magic resistance up against uh, the lot of AP that you have coming out from Rockat. 
And I just really want to keep my eyes on how Steelback is doing on this uh, Jin because he did did have a fantastic game one. And so far, 1-0-0, and zero, 165 CS, completed the Ghost Blade, playing pretty well. Yeah, he's definitely ahead of the Ezreal right now, and he even manages to dodge his way out of the Tempered Fate. Walking, stepping nice and easy, walks softly, but he has a big gun to carry, that's for sure. 18 minutes on the clock, Ghost Blade popped for Fox, but he runs back into Airwax, it's fine, he's got friends! There's the Lambs for Spite. Airwax is gonna live through it. Ray steps right forward, and Betsy hops and lasers, but he can't find the kill. Double summoners used by Fox to get out of that situation. Ambitious flash from Betsy, but he does get the return flash out from Fox, which now results in Fox having no summoners available. Something that he's gonna have to be very mindful of when going up against Parang, who's gonna be looking to dive onto that backline whenever he sees an opportunity. But Airwax. Really aggressive plays coming out from him. Two versus one. He knew that the rest of Rocket were coming in for the collapse, but he bought enough time for his team to join, provide the support that they needed, and they're actually able to force Shalka away from that tier one turret in the mid. That's what's just been so critical about this team. Airwax trusting his team to be arriving right on time. And, and when they have started these fights, it have look, it's looked seamless. They've not been able to execute 100% of the way, but to start them, they've definitely got that down to a pattern. And, and Rocket, you know, they're looking like a stronger team than last week, despite the loss we saw. Maybe Airwax trusts his team a little bit too much, and often when he goes to these hyper-aggressive teamfight starts, he's just like, team, I know you'll follow up with me, and the rest of his team is like, wait, what, you're going in? <laughs> uh, oh, but they do follow him. Eventually, after he sometimes gets caught out, which is why right yep. now, sitting at 0-2, and two, not the best way to start off a game, but still, Rocket, they're not out of it yet. They are only at an ever-so-slight deficit. They do still have a pretty good team fight comp, and if they get more engages like they had around the Dragon, where they get a fight in which suits them, one in which they can actually be the facilitators and they set it up for themselves, then there's no reason why they can't come out ahead in this team fight. Yeah, but uh, still have to be very wary of the power that Shalkar are bringing as the fight gets on. Sprottle right into Ray's. He's going to get stunned up. Tempered Fate lands, and it lands on Airwax. And Gilius, the curtain call. Steel back, grabs a kill for himself. Airwax having to flash, and a true shot barrage. Two quick cleanups, and there's no way Parang is going to get there in time. A double kill to the Triforce Ezreal. So really good pickup coming out from Rockat. They instantly go for the collapse down onto Sprawdle, but the problem is, because of how slippery this bard is, they have to invest so many resources just to actually finally get that kill, and because it took them so long, Rales is finally able to join the fight, and he cleans it up in favor of Shalke, who are now gonna go for this tier one mid. Yeah, Parang Steelback trying to pincer, but Steelback still took some time to get right in range. Steven Fox really getting punished here, as this tower will stand another day. I thought you called them Stephen Fox, and I'm like, oh, is he famous? Stephen Fox? Uh, yeah, it, it, actually, to me, it sounded like it was a really, really good sitcom. So yeah. uh, if yeah. this whole Shalka thing doesn't work out. Anyways, let's see the fight again. Ray steps right around and preempts the magical journey. I love this move. Yeah, really smart from Ray's. But unfortunately, just the positioning of Gilius to prevent the ultimate coming out from uh, from the Jin means that it just takes them a little bit too long to finally get that kill. Oh. They can't go for the disengage, and then the exhaust, a little bit too late from Ray's, and it just means that Rales gets all the damage down that he needs. He's now 4-0 and 1, sitting on a Trini Force, and already Rales having a great way to kick off this game. Yeah, uh, Steelback's definitely doing pretty hot himself, but you know, if you're going to be looking at 4-0 Ezreal, you've got to be happy with how this game is shaping up. We're 21 minutes in, Baron's been live, and obviously every prediction for uh, when are they going to take what objective? It seems to have been off the table from last game, but things here, a bit more standard, as the next Dragon spawns it is in fact Ocean once again. Julius is lying in wait to see if Rocket want to try and set up some vision, but he moves a little bit too quickly out of there, and Scuttle Crab will be taken. So, setting up for this next Ocean Drake, Shalka shoving in the bottom wave, forcing Rocket to have to deal with it so that Shalka can make this dragon acquisition just a little bit easier. Teleport unavailable for, for Parang, but is up for Steve. So I think Rocket, they just need to concede this dragon because if they try to fight it, they're not going to have the support of their top oh. laner. And, don't concede uh, the blue buff, though. Yeah. Fortunately, Rocket, they're able to give themselves the blue buff, but they don't get the blue buff onto Bet. And we're actually still playing with fire, though, man. He steps real far forward on that one. Manages to get it down, but they're going to have to give up the dragon, as you say. So, we've got one Air Drake, one Ocean Drake, but now the third one goes over to Shalka. Still in the top side. The top laners locked in an epic struggle for eternity. Steve having the teleport advantage very momentarily, but as you said, there was really no way Rocket were going to be able to contest that buff. 
And have a look at Galicia's scoreline. 1-1-5. One, one, and five. 100% kill contribution right now. And we talked about how maybe Rock actually looked to take him off this pick, but they decided not to. They haven't been able to answer it, and so far Gideas is demonstrating once again why Gragas is one of his go-to champions. He can just be so aggressive on it and setting up fights. We talk often about Gragas being a enabling, disengaging champion, but there's something to be said for the flash body slam, flash ult. He's just had so many fast moves and uh, you know, I mean, just looking at Gragas, you wouldn't think him able to move that fast, but Julius has got those quick fingers. He certainly does. Decided to actually pick up the Ionian boots, so he wants to get a bit of extra cooldown reduction in his kit mm -hmm. to enable himself to go for those picks a little bit more often. Has that extra bit of mobility, being able to use that body slam a little bit more regularly. Uh, and has also decided to pick up a very early Randuin, so wants to be dealing with the damage coming out from Steelback, who has decided to go for an Infinity Edge second, so... Mm -hmm. Wants to be dealing a lot of damage. Yeah, well, every, I think pack. everybody really wants to deal damage. Uh, but you're right, the build certainly allows it. Ra lives, of course, on the Trinity Force. Ezreal coming much more back into Vogue. And right now, Shalka, they're still on the offensive, moving into this top side as a unit, but not everyone. And Steve is actually isolated here as Parang and Airwax look to chase him down. He takes a bite, turns away from the parallel convergence, seeing if he can get his way out. Has to burn Flash at the end of the day. But he will be able to walk out, or hobble, as it were. The thing is, what is Schalke now going to do to try and punish the fact the Rock out have invested two members down into the bottom half of the map? There's not really a good objective for them to take. And right now, teleport coming in from Rock out. Yeah, Steve going a little bit low. Flash in for Rang, wants to phase dive on. Train changes attention over to Fox. Chains of corruption, though. And Airwax was in the front, tanking. Too many shots. No one goes down, however, and Rocket, sensing the danger, back away before they take any more unnecessary damage. So just a couple of summoner spells used Parang throughout the teleport, wanted to try and set up the flank for his team, but unfortunately there was just too much disengage on the lineup of Schalke, and right now, Gilius. Oh, it's Airwax. He gets knocked in, and Sprottle claims the kill. That's going to put Schalke right on the front line to try and get even more out of this. Parang going low. Chaos Storm, not enough. Rawlis sinks the goal. Steve takes a bite out of Parang. That is three kills. They might be oh. low health bars, and it's going to be answered back. Steel back gets Gilius for revenge. So, Schalke, they find the pick down onto Airwax once again. Oh, flash from Steelback. Rawlis, he just narrowly scrapes out of that fight. It is so scrappy. Raze going low, going down. Fox sinks him with the arrow. So Schalke, they've now picked themselves up four kills. They're likely going to get themselves a tier one in the mid lane, and they might even push for more. They're going to go for that tier two and build themselves a pretty big gold lead. Yeah, Schalke, they are on the offensive on the front, continuing to find the openings, probing and finally getting in. Not perfect, not without losing members, but it is looking much, much nicer for them. 6,000 gold ahead of the pack. Oh man, and let's just see how this all kicks off. Gilius, no vision on him from the flank. Airwax, not given an opportunity to use that lands respite because of how quickly he was deleted. And then with the Steve engage from the flank, Shao could just go for the cleanup. Rales gets uh, the the first hit ultimate down onto Betsy, which is enough damage to get the cleanup kill. Steel back though, trying to go for the snipe, gets the kill down onto Gideas and then Raze gets hit by that cosmic binding and goes down as well. So it's simply a matter of Schalke going for the immediate disengage after what was a really good setup initially from Rockat. A lot of summoner spells were used. Schalke go for the escape. Rockat tried to commit for this tier one turret. They don't expect the re-engage coming out from Schalke. And this just reminds me of what we saw in game one, where Rockat, they just commit a little bit too hard and they don't respect the possibilities of Schalke getting a tournament. Time and time again, they're starting to prove it. So a big lead now for Schalke. Rockat, they're gonna have some climbing back to do, but it's not like they've not been in a familiar position in terms of where the gold's at. Very different reasons, of course, this game, but this is something that they've found themselves in off in this split, and I want to see if they can make that comeback happen. If anything, they're more comfortable in this situation because kind of in, weird to more, say, in more of their games, this is the situation they have been put in. The late game team fighting is what they're all about, and all they need is Schalke to overstep their boundaries just a tad, and then Rockat can look to punish it. Yeah, exactly that. Not enough damage on Sprottle, though. So the Rylize has now been completed for Betsy. He wants to make sure that he can keep his opponents within the ultimate. Decided not to finish up the Zonyas. Values more just picking up that Seeker's Arm Guard so he has a bit of extra armor available. But three items strong now for Fox and Rylize. And those are, that is a very powerful poke duo that you have coming out from Shotgun. Yes, indeed. 
They've been using it quite effectively. Rocket still got a lot of fight in them. We'll have to see how they're able to stem this onslaught at the moment. But the War of Attrition is starting to take a toll. A lot of wards of Shalkas inside of the Rocket jungle. The 6,000 gold advantage still staying there. Airwax is caught. Tempered fate. Can they collapse on him in time? Parallel convergence, and that will cover Airwax escape. Parang tanks a true shot barrage, and that will be the end of that. So they invest a lot of resources down into trying to get Airwax, but unfortunately for Shalka, the presence of Parang and Raze is enough to just sway the continued aggression coming out from Shalka. So they don't find the pick but they are going to force Elwax back, and that might be an opportunity for Schalke to posture around this Baron. They're trying to extend their vision line deep into Rocket's half of the jungle, but they've decided that it's a little bit too risky, and they're just going to move away. No need to take those unnecessary risks for now. Rocket, they've been the ones who've been a little over-aggressive, but Schalke a bit more calculating. Dragon is live for Schalke with the map control that they have. This seems not contestable. Rocket have actually moved towards the top side, though, to see if they can get a bit more Baron vision back for themselves. And they might be okay with that trade for now, but still, the extra regeneration will mean Shalka can fight more and more often. Certainly will. And now have a look at Rockat. They're the ones posturing around the Baron, something that they need to be very mindful of. They were able to sneak it at 21 minutes in game one. Very different scenario, though. Very different, yes. Is Rales. Oh! oh! He shoots, he scores! Shalka! Wow. Wow. Rales going man mode. Gets a quick kill down onto Airwax. Talking about this man getting caught out of position. I don't think he was expecting to get caught out by a Rales right there. I want to see that one again. Rales is styling at this point. Whew. Man. Talk about, like, just sweeping through everything and just getting that pot shot off to get the kill. I mean, he doesn't even have what? vision. He just spots Raze, goes for a bit blocked. of poke, and then he notices Airwax out of position. Oh, my words. E into basic Brilliant. attack, into Q, quick kill. Airwax unavailable. Shaka feel the need to try and force this Baron. Yep, didn't even look out of position, but now 5,000 health is down. Curtain Call comes out. It's going to ping onto Rallis, but he steps aside. Over there, still on the Baron. Steve trying to zone it out, but this could be not a smite fight since Airwax way too low. Steelback will pick up a kill. That's the smite gone from Gilius. Baron, they can't take it now. It's way too unsafe. Parang, though, gets sniped down by Rallis and Shalka trying to retreat, but Steelback with the double kill. Locked up. Do they have the damage? Gravity Field. Sprato, a trip for Steelback, Benzie's down, everybody is dying in this fight. It's chaos. Fox will fall to Airwax, and Rocket get the better of that. So it's almost like Rocket find themselves a late game team fight. This is exactly the style that Rocket like to play, and Steelback coming up huge with that ultimate. He held on to that last shot for such a long time. I was so worried that he wasn't even going to use it, but he saves it. He knows that Gilius is slowly getting chunked down. He understands the damage that Jin has, and I'm not going to spoil the surprise. Just keep your eye on Steelback in there. Shot number one hits Riley. Shot number two hits Steve. Meanwhile, Parang, he's just trying to be a bit of a threat into the backline. And Gilly is taking so much damage from the Baron. 806 crit is enough to take away the smite. And then just steal back on the backline, doing so much damage completely untouched, with Raze just soaking up so much of the damage. Both of the AD carries so crucial in these games. The damage output is ridiculous. And considering Steelback is on a way less mobile carry than Rales, it is incredibly impressive what he's able to get done and the team has enabled him to do. 100% kill participation, 7 kills that Rocket have to the 13 of Shalka, but Rocket, they get themselves a serious amount of breathing room by stopping the Baron, by clearing Gilius away and winning a big fight. This is the thing about Rocket's composition and Rocket's playstyle overall. They are very good at playing around objectives, and that is not necessarily the place that Shalka want to be. They have this poke disengage composition where you use the trundle to draw pressure in a side lane and set up the flank. If you cannot set that up for yourself, and if you're not confident enough to commit to an objective like that, you have to be prepared for the response from Rockad. And so far, the response has been pretty damn good. Yeah, no kidding there. Still, a lot of individual power plays. And Schalke still rocking this 5,000 gold advantage, but it means less and less. The more the game goes on, Rocket with the late game team fights finding themselves in a comfort moment. They settle into it, but still very dangerous. This Schalke squad, they've won as many fights as they've lost in this series so far, and they're still one up on the board. Rocket trying to even that score. So now it's a battle of the 80 carries. Which will be able to carry harder, Rales or Steelback? We heard kind words from Steelback with regards to Rales just before we went to break. 
and he does have a lot of respect towards Rallis and says how he is a talented AD carry. Well, now Steelback, you get to prove whether or not you can be more talented and carry your team to a 1-1. Well, he certainly had much bigger presence over the time he's been in the LCS, but you, know, you look at the career of a player like Steelback, Starting out, his debut being on, on Fnatic and all the pressure there, but how he transformed as a player, eventually going to NA, coming back here, and, and really showing up big on the Unicorns last split. Now kind of looking like maybe not the best or the, the top AD carry in the league by any means, but still capable of making these massive flashy plays as Parang takes away the blue buff from Steve as they were dueling over that one. Rawls, on the other hand, he's always been noted as the stable AD carry. The AD carry that will never lose you the game, but rarely would he win it for you. This time around, he's starting to look like a real monster. Certainly is. 8-0-3 on that Ezra right now. 323 farm at 33 minutes. But Airwax, he's getting bullied out of his jungle. Double binding. They've got just enough damage. Gilius bops in, and else in slow motion, they got the damage they needed to find the kill. Turning now into the Baron Pit as Round five. Two. Here we go again. No smite available for Airwax. Can Rocket make the miracle defense again? Parang is not here. He doesn't have his teleport available either, but Schalke, they're being forced off this Baron once again. They can't quite decide if they want to commit to it. Oh, a moment of indecision. That can be all that turns the game. The last shot will not go where they want it to be. In comes Barang. It's going to get taken. It's Rollins that secures this up. Schalke now trying to force the rest of the fight. Rollins over the wall. Ray's no longer unbreakable. Low health bars, but he stays alive. So Rock at this time, they're not really in a good position to force the fight. Parang takes a little bit too long to get to the fight because he canceled his teleport. He couldn't Good go shot. for the play ultimate. Not Woo. gonna get the snipe Full down. Shot. But still, Rocket gave away the Baron because Airwax gets caught out of position once more. I feel like this is a phrase that I have a tendency of repeating. One, six, and two right now is really a big part as to why Schalke are able to get these leads. And it's what's giving Schalke such a big advantage in this game. Talk about big advantages too. Now they can start on this Elder Dragon. Airwax is finally up. Rocket have the option to collapse, but this Dragon's falling fast, and with the Baron buff, they do not feel like they want to dive into this one. Parang throws the Time Winder, instantly stunned. Dragon's taken away, secured again by Rollins. The fight is now on. Steve is caught and locked in the middle of it all, but Airwax, he's only got the Lancer spot on himself, but it's a fight on two fronts. Rollins secures the kill on that side, while Parang is isolated, but he turns back around. A double kill for Rollins, looking for more. They land all the damage, and it's only Steel back left. That's not going to be for long. Gilius with the barrel, the arrow to finish the job. It is a 5-4 Zero, big goal for Schalke, no fear. And Schalke, with that Baron buff, with the Dragon buff, are easily going to be able to break into the base of Rakat. And with the very long death timers, they may very well be able to close out the game. Looking for all the damage, looking for an end and a 2-0 on the game. They so badly want this. It's going to be the inhibitor. No one up for 10 more seconds. It's only going to be Razor Airwax. They've got enough time to finish this one off. And what a hard-fought victory it was. Schalke coming up huge. Rocket, kudos for playing a brilliant game. But the end score is going to be 2-0 to Schalke, no fear. Schalke, they get themselves a 2-0. A desperately needed 2-0 as well, given they were sitting at seventh place. Now going to be getting those three points, moving up in the standings at this point in the uh, in the split against a team that we have considered a very solid middle of the pack team, is only a positive thing for Shelby. The hype building up from week number one, the acquisition of this team by the Bundesliga club, and it kind of fizzled out a little bit in week number two. They weren't able to find the wins that they needed, but now taking on Rocket, who came into this game with such a clear plan. Shore up the early game aggression, make sure we can take the same fights, but still some mistakes there. Airwax getting caught out, but still setting up a lot of plays for his team. Rocket having late game team fighting, but falling and not able to contest those objectives. Schalke, well-deserved victory on the day. Yeah, what we saw from Rocket were glimmers of hope, at least they were improving, but we saw a lot more early game action from them in game one compared to game two where oh, that's for sure. they, they just kind of reverted back to their old ways. They tried to wait for a late game team fight and they definitely found a few opportunities, but usually those fights were forced off the back of Airwax getting caught out.
and unfortunately for Rocket, it never seems to be a situation where they are the team setting up their own plays. They're not the ones getting in that vision first, setting themselves up for success. It's very much reactive play that's happening all the time. And if Rocket aren't able to change that play style, you're going to end up in a situation where Schalke, they pick themselves a great kite composition, a great poke composition, and you can just constantly pick off the disorganized team that Rocket come across to be. Yeah, especially with how fast Gilius is able to fly in there on Gragas. Talk about using your momentum. But you know, really impressive team play all around. And looking at this game with two teams that were sitting on the lower end of the middle, really just kind of hovering there, fifth, sixth, seventh, it means you know, not as much when you're one point separated, but now a big statement from Schalke to say we are the stronger squad and a well-earned three points to them as they can walk very, very happy with today's results. They certainly can. Have to be honest, very impressed with how Schalke executed. The the fact that okay, they had a bit of a misplay with the Baron, but overall nobody's perfect. Yeah, yes. come on, their, man. Their early game was was very good. They they played the map very well. Their picks, their setup, punishing the mispositions of Rockat was fantastic. And this Gragas on Gilius, this is why we wondered in week two whether or not it would be taken off him. Gilius didn't have the best performance in week two, but it seems to be that he's back on track, especially on this Gragas. The ability for him to make plays and set his team up for success seems to be exactly what Schalke needed. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting mirror on both these teams, actually, the jungler and, and key picks being so quintessential to what they're able to accomplish. I mean, again, even though they lost 2-0, and even though Airwax was a big part of them getting caught out, he still set up some really, really incredible plays, in particular in that game number one that honestly could have swung Either way. It certainly could have. And it's just, it's, it's so upsetting for Rockat. It's heartbreaking, really, it is, to, yeah. to go down to a, That really doesn't speak to how close the series was. Yeah. Um, I would argue that the second game was a little bit more one sided towards Schalke, who seemed to just have a little bit more control. They just seemed to be more confident in their composition, what they drafted. It was very similar to what we saw in game one. Absolutely. And it was clearly a composition that they had practiced a lot and had come into this game fully understanding what they wanted to do and how to execute on it. Uh, and it's just, it's just unfortunate the Rock Act they couldn't do the same thing. Yeah, well, Schalke, more confidence means a more win. Well, we're going to hear a bit more from that as Pol.